Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about nuclear threat and war and peace and activism with Norman Solomon, who is the co-founder and national director of RootsAction.org, where I work as well, and who founded the Institute for Public Accuracy and is its executive director. Norman's books include Made Love Got War, War Made Easy, and most recently, War Made Invisible. Norman Solomon, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot, David. I should say welcome back. You've been here before. You, you've got a, a recent article in The Nation and elsewhere called Time for a Transnational Uprising Against a Reckless Escalation of the Arms Race. Question mark. I don't know if the question mark is really needed, but... Uh, can you describe what uh, you're talking about there? Looking back at uh, the last several decades when I've been alive anyway, it's been pretty stunning to me where the dangers were recognized. Well, for instance, way back in 1982, when about a million people gathered in Central Park in New York City and said, as they say in Spanish, basta, enough, more than enough, let's roll back the nuclear arms race. And there was a growing awareness in the 80s, even Ronald Reagan, who was pretty deaf to reason when he first became president, was persuaded by a combination of forces, including very much organizing transatlantically in the US and Europe particularly, to take some good steps like the INF Intermediate Range Nuclear Treaty that banned a whole class of intermediate range weapons, signed it at the White House with Gorbachev. Very exciting, 1987. A yeah. Step back, another step back. And so to me, it's really crucial that we see the path not taken that would have been sanity and just how deranged this arms race is now. It's always been incredible to me that there was an understanding of a problem. The problem wasn't actually removed, but the understanding disappeared. Uh, what, what accounts for the difference in activism, in politics, in media between the 1980s and now? Well, so many factors, certainly the power of military contractors, and we can go to today and we've got Raytheon, we have Boeing, we have uh, Northrop Grumman, and they're making a killing literally and figuratively through all kinds of weapons. And certainly nuclear weapons are just really high up there. Northrop Grumman just got, and this will be before the cost overruns, uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars uh, contract to build a new so-called generation of ICBMs, the land-based nuclear missiles that are now in five US states, tremendous power. And uh, the lobbying power, political and media leverage, uh, huge. William Hartung, who's done such great research and documentation, has reported there are 700 military supply lobbyists on Capitol Hill. So that's more than one for each member of the House and Senate. That's certainly part of the explanation. Uh, Robert J. Lifton, the psychiatrist, referred to psychic numbing. Who wants to think about nuclear weapons all the time or much of any of the time for most people? And those combination of factors, the overall militarism uh, of US society and the failures of leadership, which are aggregate results of those factors and so much more. So it's really difficult to pull one strand out. I think of it as a sort of a stew where unfortunately, how could one contemplate the current political economy without militarism? It's at least half of the discretionary budget of the US government. It permeates so much of the culture, the economy, and it's a madness. You know, Dan Ellsberg in his wonderful, powerful book, The Doomsday Machine, starts out uh, quoting Nietzsche that madness in individuals is rare, but in societies and groups, it's common. And we have basically a deranged society in the United States. It's a death culture. The economy is largely based on killing and planning to kill virtually everyone on the planet. 
about 99% of us humans on the earth would lose our lives within, oh, perhaps several months to a year because of nuclear winter. If there is this Armageddon annihilation, whatever you want to call it from nuclear war, th that's pretty insane. <laughs> pretty insane indeed. I, I want to get back to your article in The Nation, but I just have to ask in this moment when you can have this publicly acknowledged, proudly advertised genocidal war in Gaza and then flip a switch and turn it off for a few days or a week and then flip a switch and turn it back on again. I mean, it, it seems to me nothing normalizes madness more than this idea that you'll start up mass murder, genocidal horror, uh, and turn it off and negotiate for a while and then turn it back on again. Uh, it seems to me incredible that, that this can be the norm. Most of the definitions of genocide really will fit what Israel with US backing militarily and politically uh, has been inflicting on people now for close to two months in Gaza. And then we have this supposed uh, sane, rational, reasonable, moderate response from some members of Congress, even not that many. Let's have a pause, a pause in genocide. Wait, that just boggles the mind, and yet it's been so normalized. And then you look at, say, the House of Representatives, where 435 people, several weeks into the mass killing, where, according to the United Nations, 40% of those being killed were children. And the numbers were getting up to eight, 9,000 civilians being killed. According to the UN, 10 children an hour were being slaughtered. 18 members of the House are co-sponsors of the resolution. So that's 4% of the House. This is just an indicator of the fear that's involved, the conformity, the go along to get along. Don't stick your head above the barricades. And certainly there are many factors. Republicans generally are more rabid and militaristic, although there have been some real exceptions in recent years than Democrats, but Democrats have one of their own party in the White House. And so there's so-called party discipline, which is just, hey, we're all in the madhouse together. Don't step outside. Exactly. Um, I, I, I want to go back to your article in The Nation and see if you think there's anything that we should be learning from what people were doing 40 years ago. You, you begin with uh, recounting a debate that you took part in in The Nation uh, 40 years prior, right? Yeah, I was, uh, I didn't feel young at the time, but I was in my early 30s then. And in retrospect, I, I seem to have been youthful. And I had read an article in The Nation by the very esteemed left-wing historian E.P. Thompson, who basically, while leading the disarmament movement in large measure in Europe, was warning that we not become, quote, fellow travelers succumbing to sentimentalism toward the Soviet Union. And my response, and the nation did print it in what turned out to be two editions of a debate, I replied that let's look at history, that history does matter, and that in every stage of the nuclear arms race, this doesn't let Russia off the hook, but at every iteration of the nuclear arms race uh, since the mid 1940s, it was the United States leading the way. And in retrospect, if you look at this century, the abrogation of treaties between the two biggest nuclear superpowers, the uh, bilateral treaties with the Open Skies Treaty for inspection, there was the ABM Treaty, very important, there was the INF Treaty that I mentioned that Reagan and Gorbachev signed in 1987. All three of those were canceled by the U.S. government um, preemptorily, um, in, I think insanely, just saying, okay, we had this really good treaty. Let's get rid of it. And yes, it was a Bush that got rid of the ABM Treaty. It was Trump uh, that got rid of INF and Open Skies. But they were followed by Democrats in the White House. And Obama didn't lift a finger, really, to reinstate 
the ABM treaty, nor has Biden done anything to try to reinstate the other two. So there's, without getting sort of uh, too uh, metaphorical about it, there's this um, disease in the air. There's this um, psychological virus, you might say, that permeates the governing classes. And it doesn't um, really mitigate the situation that it's so extremely profitable for a few. So this is just a boondoggle. And if you look at, for instance, what's happened with the uh, war on Palestinian people supplied in large measure by the United States, not only is there an extraordinary 10 year, $3.8 billion a year arms aid package that the US is now about seven years into a 10 year package, all of a sudden 14 billion to B dollars more of military weaponry is being shipped from the US to Israel while they're slaughtering children. So it really is hard uh, to step back and see or to go forward and see anything but a murderous government that is in a democracy, we are told. We are speaking with Norman Solomon, uh, among many other things, director of rootsaction.org. Roots Action has been working uh, on a coalition called Defuse Nuclear War. Um, so there, there is some activism that you're involved with. What, what have people been doing and what does it seem might work uh, to start moving us in the opposite direction of normalizing and celebrating nuclear armament? This might be a little bit of a consolation that if groups like Roots Action and, and many others at the grassroots and, and some national organizations, if we hadn't been active, whether it's getting any media coverage or not, whether it's in the news or not, on a whole range of crucial issues, things would be even worse than they are now. So it's a sense of collective responsibility and opportunity. I think of it often as a metaphor of a train that if a train is at a dead stop and then something comes up and it needs to move, that's very difficult. Whereas at least if you have a train running to some degree, then you're not at a dead stop. You can respond and move forward relatively quickly. That's why ongoing organizations are so important because they are rolling. And the reality is that most of our society is at a dead stop and involved and meshed with the war machinery. We have this humongous, lucrative for the wealthy war machine, and really the Israeli military is part of that war machine. And de facto, through policy, the US has made the Ukrainian military part of the US war machine. $44 billion in military shipments in less than two years to Ukraine from the United States. Uh, I gave the example of Israel as well, shipping these uh, massive quantities of weapons to Israel while Palestinian people are being killed from the air and now from the ground. And there's an opportunity for us to look in a fresh way at this and say, rather than fueling the carnage, we have a very different responsibility and that requires organizing. I believe that activists, well-meaning activists, not only incorporate sometimes a worldview or language that's counterproductive, such as calling what the Pentagon has defense spending, there's nothing defense about it, it's military spending, but also we're too polite to the people in power. Just because a member of Congress did A, B, C, D, E, F, and G that you think is good, what if they're doing some terrible things or supporting policies that are extremely destructive to humanity? Why just defer to them? Why be overly deferential? They're supposed to work for us. That is perhaps a cliche, but it's supposed to be the reality. Governance is supposed to involve the informed consent of the governed. If we've informed ourselves, unless we're active, then we're letting the horrific momentum move in the wrong direction. We're, we're actually in a strange moment now in which some U.S. and Ukrainian officials are talking somewhat like 
we have talked for over a year and a half that the victory is a delusion. It's a stalemate. You're not getting anywhere. End it with the best compromise you can. And at the same moment, I'm having conversations with peace activists who are saying, well, we're going to have to focus on Gaza right now. Let's take a pause on Ukraine and do the Gaza war for some time, and then we'll get back to trying to end the war in Ukraine. I mean, it seems to me that Biden's trying to fund four wars in one bill. Is no, you know, we ought to be rallying against all of them at once. But the reality is bit of the U.S. public that opposes one war is very different from the population that opposes a different war. So what do we do? Well, the diplomacy has become a dirty word, the concept that you engage in diplomatic uh, processes because that's the way war is averted and peace is achieved. When, when diplomacy becomes a dirty word as it has in so many contexts, then we need to push back against that. And I suppose the simultaneous wars woven together in overall what Dr. King called the madness of militarism could be identified as Russia, uh, Austin, uh, the Secretary, so-called Secretary of Defense, said that the Ukraine war could weaken the Russian military. That's been a goal. And so there's that uh, Cold War ginned up there's the approach to China where, how dare China have their military uh, vessels in the South China Sea? Let's not talk about why the middle name of the South China Sea is what it is. And then there's Ukraine, which is certainly a proxy war. And then there's the killing in Gaza, which again, Israel among many other things is basically a huge military base for the US military industrial complex. And the futility and insanity of it is just uh, so horrific because where we are now, and it won't be more than a couple more months where it'll be the second year anniversary of the Ukraine invasion and this horrific war, we're in a place where there could have been negotiations 20 months ago. This could have been solved before the war even started. We had Biden doing a news conference shortly before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And he was asked point blank, what do you think about the idea of Ukraine joining NATO? And Biden said, well, if they want to join NATO, that's their prerogative. Wrong. That's completely the wrong answer. It was telegraphing to Moscow. Yeah, we want to keep moving NATO up to your borders with the kind of military uh, threat that we would find absolutely unacceptable in the Western hemisphere, let alone in Mexico and China or Mexico and Canada, pointing in our direction, the missiles of the sort of military armaments that the US has gradually through NATO put up against the Russian border. Of course, we would never tolerate any such things in the US if it was pointing from Canada or Mexico. David, you've done this great work about the anniversary and gee, what, 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine. And I guess that's not enough to run one hemisphere. The attitude is the US government and the military should try to dominate the other hemisphere as much as possible also. As you've pointed out, 4% of the world's population and we're supposed to run the world. The It's not just hypocrisy, it's just that it doesn't work in the long run. People elsewhere on the planet when we essentially through action say, do as we say, not as we do, it's just not convincing. Well, at, at the risk of being too polite to high officials, uh, let's talk a little more about Genocide Joe, uh, which I think uh, is a name he's earned. Uh, you and Roots Action have been pushing for a long time that uh, the Democrats would be better off with a better candidate, uh, not just morally, practically, uh, policy-wise better off, but more likely to win when we finally get to the end of the three-year-long election obsession. Uh, and now there's starting to be voices in the corporate media agreeing, but at the same time suggesting that, oh, well, maybe it's too late to be agreeing. What's, <laughs> what are the prospects for candidate Joe? It's really uh, disconcerting to feel like Cassandra. And now it's almost too late because at Roots Action, 
our first Don't Run Joe campaign, which segued into Step Aside Joe when Biden became a formal candidate, the writings were on the wall in terms of polling numbers, his decreasing popularity, the well-earned alienation among young voters because of climate and failure to really fight for student debt, uh, his failure to really challenge uh, income inequality, and so much else. And so one could see it coming, but there were at least symbolic blinders on for the um, elite media, of course, the spinning coming out of out of the White House. And to me, among other things, it's really um, very striking, the discipline, the party discipline, because it's self-imposed. It really was such a gap that was and is humongous, where polling routinely said a majority of Democrats didn't want Biden to run for president again. And you could hardly find any Democrats, 250 of them in the House and Senate, you could find like you could count on one hand the numbers who would come close to even saying that. So <laughs> what's wrong with that? Pretty much everything. It's, it's a complete disconnect. And I think it's a matter of two uh, different parallel problems that Roots Action has been pointing out through uh, this campaign now, Step Aside Joe. One is that if we're against fascism, which is uh, really in the offing from uh, where Trump uh, has evolved, then you want to defeat the fascist candidate. That's one point. The other is when you have a militarist like Biden in the White House, when he fails to challenge corporate power and allows income disparities to get worse, when he increases the chances of nuclear war to incinerate the planet and close to end the human race on Earth, then don't you think we need a better candidate? I mean, that would be sort of elemental. And yet the what's misnamed as party loyalty, which is just actually better described as uh, party obedience to the point of um, uh, going along to get along with a suicidal, omnicidal program, we really have trouble dislodging, even now as we speak, late in 2023, this fixation from so-called leaders in Congress who are Democrats. I mean, come on. Uh, if you can't speak honestly and you're in Congress, uh, let's out vote you out so we can get somebody in who stops uh, spinning and starts getting real about the perils to the human race. My my fantasy, maybe it is just a fantasy for a silver lining in an election system that seems to get worse and worse every cycle, uh, is that some people who are fed up will dump some of the millions of dollars that are always dumped into U.S. elections into principled policy-based activism, including on reforming the electoral system, uh, on having open, fair elections without the gerrymandering and the money and the, the president able to control the primaries and, and all the rest of the corruption, because uh, you don't get those things by voting for them. You get them through activism. Is it, uh, is it delusional to think that maybe some people would put some of that pile of loot just this one time into nonviolent activist movements that, that have more impact in any case than elections do? That could be encouraged effectively to the extent that history is promulgated about the reality of this country for more than 200 years. Virtually everything that we have to be proud of didn't emanate from the White House or Congress. It emanated from grassroots organizing and building movements. Nothing is given from on high, as Frederick Douglass said, and you have to fight for it. It's not going to simply be handed down to you uh, from people in power. That's just not the way uh, the human reality works. Recognizing that would then require or call for pouring so much more, as you allude to, David, energy, resources, time into building social movements. And this is a misconception, I think, that is very common in politics and certainly in corporate media. It's encouraged that social movements are the subset of electoral campaigns. 
when actually that's bass backwards. Election campaigns should be subsets of social movements. And the recognition of that fact was really crucial to the successes of the Bernie Sanders for president campaigns because he was associating himself and being part of and had always been part of social movements. I think one of the very best and unfortunately exceptional because there are so few such members of Congress is Rashida Tlaib because she consistently talks about being part of and she is part of social movements. That's where our best future is. Well, I would vote for her, but uh, <laughs> she's going to be lucky if we can just keep her in Congress. Uh, Norman Salmon, we got two or three minutes left. What do you recommend that people do who want to get involved and be informed and follow what you're doing? Along with being very personally well-informed and sharing information with friends, coworkers, colleagues, and so forth, Supporting organizations crucial, and here I want to be very biased. World Beyond War is a great organization, David, which you founded a number of years ago, World Beyond War. Another biased recommendation is rootsaction.org. We started out with zero supporters online. We now have a bit over one million, and it's a way to connect with others. The atomization, I guess you could say, the alienation, the you're in this by yourself, you should be out for yourself only. That's a culture that spins downward into depression, defeat, and ultimately um, ecological and social destruction. So we have the option to do the opposite. We need to, as the saying goes, negate the negation and working with others. And I'd sort of close on this thought, I suppose. I've heard from folks, understandably, they'll say, well, I." I really am concerned about this issue or that, but it's so depressing that I feel like I, I, I'd rather just not get involved. And the reality that I think most people really experience is that it's the opposite. If you're passive, if you tune into history and the news, like it's just wonder bread off the shelf, yeah, that's really gonna be depressing. But if you're active, if you connect with other people, if you're engaged in collective activities, that gives you some excitement, enthusiasm, and hope. It's not hope of the kind that President Obama was peddling, you know, the Democratic Party and Obama gave hope a bad name, the Republicans have given religious faith a bad name. Not that kind of facile hope, but real hope grounded on working together. Sounds good to me. We have been speaking with Norman Solomon, director of RootsAction.org. We will have links to his articles in The Nation and at RootsAction up at TalkWorldRadio.org. Norman, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at RootsAction.org. Help end war at WorldBeyondWar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.